Welcome to Mic'd Up. Please welcome Pedro Domingos in conversation with Eric Schmidt. Um, Pedro uh, is a professor at University of Washington, and his story is quite interesting. He came out of Portugal, did his PhD here in Southern California, and was one of the early people to say, I'm going to do machine learning before machine learning really existed. You probably know him as the author of a very, very successful book called The Master Algorithm. And I thought what we should do, since we're both computer scientists, is spend at least five minutes talking about the actual science of what's going on. So sort of level set what's real and what's not. And then I think both of us have an opinion about what will happen, what we sh people should do. And I think we should explore that uh, in front of you all and with you all. Um, what's new in the area of machine learning, AI, computer science that, that is really going to affect all of us? Yeah, I think... Um this is a very good question because machine learning and AI are actually decades old. Why, why is it that they're only now taking off? And I think a large part of the reason is that the way we initially tried to do AI didn't work. Right? There was this thing called the AI summer when there was a lot of promise. People thought AI was going to take over the world. This was back in the 80s. And then it all failed. What people were trying to do then was to program you know, all the intelligence into the computer. You know, it's a called knowledge engineering approach. But that is just beyond our power to do. People know too many things, and, and they're too complicated. The thing that has really changed today is that instead of having us program the computers, we're getting the computers to program themselves. So instead of the computers having to acquire the knowledge from people, they acquire the knowledge from data. And this, as it turns out, is extremely powerful, because you know, if I want to program a computer to, say, play chess, I have to write a chess playing program. If I want to program a computer to drive a car, I have to program it to drive a car. With machine learning, a single learning algorithm, the same learning algorithm, can learn to do all of these different things if you give it the right kind of data. So there was this change of approach in AI to doing things based on learning, which is now bearing fruit. And of course, there's three elements to this. One is the machine learning algorithms have gotten a lot better recently. We also have a lot more data, right? The beauty of machine learning is that as you get more data, your machine learning systems become more powerful with essentially no extra work on your part. So as the data goes exponentially, the machine learning has gotten better and better. And also, of course, the other aspect of this is that we need the computing power to take advantage of the data. But we have that combination of, these things, of those three things happening today. So there's a lot of progress happening and a lot of things that, that couldn't be done before that, that can be done now. So what are the hardest technical problems that your research is about what are, the, what are the things that are the most challenging things before us in the next few years as a scientific question? Yeah, so the, 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 the crucial problem in machine learning is to generalize from what you've seen to what you have not seen. It's predicting the future. Having, let's say I want to do medical diagnosis, having you know, a bunch of patient records is not enough. I want to know what the diagnosis for the future patients are. So machine learning is all about generalization. The big problem that we have is that all of the machine learning algorithms that we have today, even the most advanced deep learning algorithms that do a lot of things right now, they can only generalize so far from the data points that they have. Right? Their ability to go beyond what they've seen is far, far smaller than the ability that we humans have. Humans can generalize incredibly far from what they've seen before. So the real research frontier is to get the, you know, the algorithms to generalize further. You know, I'll give you an example. Think of you know, robot manipulation. The state-of-the-art you know, deep learning for robotics, it can learn, for example, to pick up this cup, sorry to use your cup, uh, you know, in maybe 100 trials, which is great. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot better than it was before. But then if I want to pick up this bottle, I have to learn again from scratch. I, the computer, have to learn again from scratch. Whereas you, know, you and I, by the time we're three, we can pick up any object that we want. We actually have no idea how to do this today. Actually, I'm lying. I have an idea which I'm pursuing in my research, but, but we'll see if it pans out or not. The, um, our industry has been sort of taken over by this, and many computer scientists think that this area will now, it's probably the most important thing to happen in computer science as a 50 years, a very, 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 very big claim. Uh, Maybe we should explore a little bit some of the implications, and you talked about them in your book a little bit, um, of what this means. So um, how much smarter will these systems get in 5, 10, 15 years? Um, and what are the implications for that? So let's start with how much smarter, right? There's a sense of optimism and all sorts of forward claims, but I'm never sure 
what's really going to happen, of course. Yeah, I think people, this again happens in general with technology, right? But I think people are overestimating what machine learning can do in the short term, uh, but underestimating what it will do in the, in the long term. I think we should distinguish between what you can do with today's machine learning algorithms if there was no more progress, just by applying them to different industries, you know, and different problems within each industry. This will be very, very large. Uh, you know, the impact of just this will be extremely large, right? The fraction of what's already happened is absolutely tiny, right? The companies that use machine learning very well, Google being, of course, you know, the, the leading example, they don't just use machine learning for one thing. They use machine learning for hundreds of things. So, and this wave front, as it progresses to different industries, has a very long way to run. Having said that, um, the impact that is to, as I was just saying, the current machine learning arms are actually still very limited. They're just taking advantage of this wave of data. It's really incumbent on us, the researchers, to create the next generation of machine learning algorithms that are you know, uh, more comparable to humans in their ability to learn. And I think once we have that, the, the impact from that will dwarf even this. So you know, like you know, Bill Gates you know, um, says that you know, a breakthrough in machine learning would be worth 10 Microsofts, which is you know, about, I don't know, uh, it's, it's you know, trillions of dollars. Or five trillion. Yeah, five trillion, there you go. Uh, <laughs> see, this, this is the businessman speaking, right? Uh, I think that once we get to this level of machine learning, it won't be five, it's five trillion with the first kind of, you know, wave that I was talking about, which is the current one. Once we get to the really better machine learning, it's, it's, it's a new world economy. So, so let's work on the five trillion, right? right? Yeah. With this audience, right? Um, you and I spent a lot of time on these subjects, and, uh, and in particular with your book, you've had a chance to talk about the financial industry and optimizing things. So rather than sort of talking about what's in the book, why don't you tell people what they should do now for the science that exists today to make things better or to make more money or whatever their goal is? Yeah, well, so there's actually two things, right? One is understanding how machine learning is going to affect different industries and different plays in different industries. Like, for example, I think there are players, for example, in the, you know, to take the computer industry, I think Apple is extremely vulnerable because the kind of stuff that they do very well is becoming commoditized, whereas the future is more things like machine learning for vision, gesture understanding, speech, and they, much, you know, they have a lot more trouble doing that. So as machine learning goes into different industries, I think it's going to change you know, you know, how different you know, players are doing. And it's also going to create a lot of new opportunities for, for, for things that don't exist yet, right? Think of every job description in the Bureau of Labor Statistics list of, you know, I don't know, 100,000 job descriptions, and think of how you could do each one of those with machine learning. There's thousands and thousands of successful startups uh, you know, to be done by doing that. So this is one aspect. The other aspect is the impact of machine learning on, on finance, on investing. Uh, you know, actually predicting you know, stock fluctuations was one of the early killer apps of, of, of machine learning. And you know, uh, these days, of course, there's more and more using computers uh, to, to, to do a lot of these predictions so, so, and analysis. So let's be precise. So today we have a number of people who run quant quantitative funds here uh, who do what I would call traditional linear regression with physicists at a scale that's impossibly right. powerful. Um, what happens with them? They, yeah. Those are not learning algorithms today. How do they fix it? Yeah, so for example, a linear regression is the basic way to do these things. The, the reason why this became a kill app of machine learning early on is that with machine learning, you can learn nonlinear models. And the phenomena that we're modeling are actually nonlinear. Some of, of them are actually are. highly nonlinear. And so if, if you're using a linear regression and I'm using a neural network, I can beat you because right. I, can, I can predict things better than, than you can. But then, of course, it's an arms race. And these days, you know, those things were neural networks. These days, we start to see evolutionary algorithms on top of the neural networks because, you know, it, it's so, a race. So another way of saying that, and I believe this very strongly, is that um, using various forms of reinforcement learning, you can deal with pretty much arbitrary human complexity, dynamic complexity of suppliers as well as consumers. And so if you think about it in markets, markets are the biggest sort of um, game that where the rules are always changing. But it should be possible with continuous reinforcement learning where you're continually testing to continue to discover the patterns equal to or better than the best traders. It should be possible. Yeah, I mean, so far what has happened is that the machine, this is actually true not just in finance but in many others, that the machine learning algorithms and the human beings have different strengths and weaknesses, right? The strength of the machine learning algorithm is that it can look at much more data than a human being can. The strength of the human being 
is that a human being can look at factors that the machine learning algorithms can't. Like, for example, you know, how do the prospects of war affect you know, the markets or particular companies? But what's happening today is that more and more of these things are becoming available in a form that the algorithms can't take advantage of. So you can mine you know, Twitter for, for early signs of, of, of you know, changes in sentiment. You can mine you know, satellite photos of the parking lot of Walmart to see how Walmart is doing. So I think eventually what's going to happen is that the day-to-day -day running of things is going to be done by machine learning, and our job as human beings is to kind of like be the, the captain of the ship. It, you know, we're going to have bigger ships and we're going to have more ships, but most of the day-to-day you know, -day work is going to be done by, by machine learning. So, so what I, the way I express this is that um, whenever you see patterns that are visual or studyable, that are repeatable, computers are better at figuring them out. And at least at the moment, for things which are black swan events, unlikely, hard to predict, there's not a lot of training data, the sentiment example that you did, predicting horrific things like terrorism and the th things which are fortunately rare in our uh, daily lives, uh, it's much, much harder. So one way to think about this is the technology for things where there's a great deal of data, especially time series data, and an awful lot of activity, which should fit well to your point about trading. No, yeah, exactly. And so this gets back to my earlier point that where we need more progress in machine learning is in generalizing farther from the data okay. so that we can you know, perform well even if we have less data. And the good news is you know, we're making a lot of progress on that. At this point, machine learning can actually predict a lot of element, you know, um, e events that are rare, maybe not black swans, but you know, a common misconception about machine learning is that it can only you know, predict things that are repeats of something that happened before. We actually have... A lot of machine learning algorithms, they, they can actually predict fairly reliably things that have never happened before. Having said that, there's still a very long way to go. The, it's interesting that you have a view um, about corporations, that when these uh, technological waves come along, new corporations emerge, or maybe corporations change. Mm -hmm. Take us through that argument. Yeah, I think not even just new corporations, but new kinds of corporations, right? If you look at, you know, even, even since, the, like, you know, in the 19th century, the quintessential big company was the railroad, right? And there was a good way to run a railroad. And then, you know, the, the production line came along, and Ford was the quintessential company, and there were ways to do that, right? This was the time of Taylorism and so on and so forth. And then, you know, General Motors came along, which was a, a different kind of company. And every time there's a new technology wave, the ideal type of company to exploit that technology and, and bring it to the consumer changes. And I think, you know, what we're seeing now is this phase shift towards a new kind of company be because there is machine learning and machine learning can be used in every nook and cranny of the company from understanding the customer and personalizing to optimizing your processes. What, we, what we're starting to see emerge is a new kind of company that takes advantage of this versus, you know, a company that doesn't. And as you say, those the new kind of company could be a transformation of an existing company. So, you know, if I was running a company, this would be one of the highest things on my radar. It can also be, and in, in, any, in every of these ages it, it often is, you know, completely new companies, you know, that, that start from scratch. So, for example, with machine learning today, there's the companies that still don't use much machine learning. Those, I think, really, really need to, uh, you know, to, to, to hurry up. There's the companies that are using machine learning, but they mostly bolting machine learning onto processes that already existed. It's like, let's do a machine learning project and, you know, start doing this thing by machine learning, leave it in place for six months and then do another one. This is, you know, it's better than no machine learning, but this is not the way things are going to work in the future. The way things are going to work in the future is that machine learning is embedded in everything from day one. You know, as in, as in your brain, right? In your brain, every single one of your neurons is, is continually learning. There is no neuron in your brain that doesn't learn. And, you know, and you don't like, you know, learn, you know, and, you know, until you're age three and then completely stop learning. Most machine learning systems today, there's a learning phase and then nothing happens, which means that as time progresses, they become less and less intelligent. So in the future, we're going to have these companies where there's this very short action-reaction loop. The machine learning is continually happening. The machine learning is present everywhere. The, the boundary between what learning does and what humans do is continually shifting. Maybe it shifts towards machine learning once the learning system figures out how to do what the humans do, but it may also shift back if certain things start to not work and now you need human intelligence to go and... So I can give you all a, a couple of examples. Um, we think we have the best data center engineers in the world. We're very proud of them, and they're certainly very proud of themselves. And uh, <laughs> our, our data centers are perfectly tuned 
through tremendous algorithmic work to meet the needs, because it's hugely capital efficient. Think about the scale of our dinner centers and so forth. So one of our teams used these techniques and in a few weeks managed to produce a 15%, 1-5% improvement in energy efficiency of our world's best data centers. And I said, what? How is that possible? And the answer is that we looked at the patterns of usage and then the things that we could control. In data centers, it's about fans and turning on racks and moving things around and so forth. And it's much more dynamic than the top people saw in terms of their, their traditional analyses using traditional tools. Now, you sit there and you go, these are the best tuned of this kind of a thing, and you can get a 15% measured energy efficiency. Imagine if you did that around energy distribution in the United States. Think about the improvement in carbon footprint and or the efficiency in lowering costs and distribution and so forth. Um, there are many, many people who think they're doing this, but I'll, I'll help ask, give, you, give you the question to ask. Uh, our teams in, uh, released a library about a year called TensorFlow. A tensor is essentially a multi-dimensional matrix, and the underlying algorithms that Pedro and others invented um, use these matrices and multiply them in very complicated ways. So that library has been adopted by pretty much everybody. It's free, always a good price. And so the question you should ask uh, if you're running a company of your engineers is, what solution does use of TensorFlow enable that we've never heard of before? That's the right question to answer, because then it'll force them to sit there and think, I have a lot of data here, I've got this question, can I learn something and predict something? With that. Yeah, there's actually, this brings up a good point, which is there's really two kinds of use of machine learning. One is where you go into an existing process and you just do it better, faster, more accurately uh, uh, with, with, with machine learning. And, you know, this in some ways is the lower hanging fruit. But then there's, I think, where a lot of the bigger progress is going to come from is where you think of entirely new things that you can do with machine learning that, you know, that human beings didn't even think of yeah. doing. And I think a reasonable view for the business world is that ultimately every, cons every customer will be unique. Uh, you'll come up with all sorts of ways to market and, and support and sell to that customer based on all of the data that you can assemble and they'll be a happier customer and you'll make more money. Um, I'll give you an example. If you're a venture capitalist in the audience, I sort of come to a, a view that just as when the smartphone came out with maps on it, you should have invested in Uber because that's the obvious app on top of a smartphone with a map, right? because you have a GPS and so forth. There's a next one, and I'll take you through the argument. Uh, today in the computer science world, it's basically Android or iPhone as your access point. By the way, Android's more popular than iPhone, but we won't go into that. <laughs> um, a fast network and then a, uh, cloud computing, as it's called. There are three main vendors, of which Google is one of them. Um, and you have this fast network, cloud computing, and you have this phone. So you set off to do an app. Well, the most successful companies, in my view, will be a, a hybrid of what you said, where you'll get the consumers to help you learn. I'll give you my, my favorite example of, um, you know nothing about dermatology, and, but you're a very good computer scientist and a very good programmer, and you care about dermatology. So what you do, and you get some money from a venture capitalist, and you write um, some code that will learn what a dermatologist does. And you pay a dermatologist $1 per training event. And you train against that. You get all the dermatologists, this is cancer, this is not, this is good, this is bad. And you know nothing, right, as a scientist, but you get that training data. You then put it into the machine learning engine, and guess what? When it comes out, it's better than the dermatologist, and you sell it back to them for more than a dollar. Because it's higher quality. I know that sounds crazy, but that's actually how it works. Yeah. You crowdsource the data, you crowdsource the learning, if you will, get the customer to teach you, and then you build a product which is better than the individual customer, and then they pay you. That model, in my opinion, is repeatable across a wide range of medical examples, and probably in many, many industrial processes. Yeah, actually, you know, uh, phones and apps are a good example of, I think, how machine learning can drastically change a market. You know, there's, there's you know, millions of apps, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of money from apps, there's a lot of people that make their living from apps. But the way apps work right now is that I build my app, my app is a standalone thing, I want you to use my app. And, you know, but at the end of the day, people don't have, you know, the patience to deal with thousands of apps, so they just have a few. 
Now, what happens with machine learning, and this is already happening, is that the, your, your phone, right, is like your personal assistant. It learns about you all the time, and it knows what you want. It knows what you're going to want. It knows what you mean when you ask something. And then it calls on the apps to do things. I don't have to stitch together the apps to accomplish what I want, like you know, figure out what restaurant to eat at, and then how to get there, et cetera, et cetera. This, this machine learning assistant that knows how I work does this for me. As a result of which, if you are someone who makes apps, this completely changes how you should work. If you have this little standalone app that is not customizable and doesn't work with others, uh, you know, your future is dim. You actually want your, your app to be as open to learning and modification and personalization as possible so that the agent that's actually in control will decide to use that for the good things. And also that works very well with others because, again, there, there is this machine learning agent that puts together the pieces. So I think we're starting to see this and it's going to you know, unfold in the next few years. Oh. We have a time for a few more questions, and one question I'll ask you, because you teach this, why are there only a relatively small number of universities that are producing the graduates and the technical capabilities to do something this fundamental? Uh, I'm happy to have the, the West Coast be the leader in the companies in this area, um, but that doesn't seem to serve the world right. It should be ubiquitous. We should have fantastic talent everywhere in the world doing those. It's not the water, it's not the weather. So what is it? I think it's a couple of things. One thing is that we need professors to teach those courses, but they keep going to industry to work for companies uh, like Google. Yes, we have been hiring them. <laughs> but, but thank you for your top graduates. <laughs> no, so uh, um, um, I think machine learning has suddenly exploded as a result of which we can't keep up with demand on any dimension, right? So we can't train but, but, um, people fast enough. But, but there's all of these brilliant mathematicians and brilliant physicists who are not going to get jobs, and we'll hire them for millions of dollars a year in our industry. Yeah. Uh, why, yeah. why is this market signal not solving this problem? No, quickly? exactly. Uh, I think it's for a couple of reasons. One is that machine learning is that, so in order to do machine learning well, you need to know computer science very well. You need to know probability and statistics very well. You need to know things like, you know, tensor algebra very well, et cetera, et cetera. So finding people who actually have this combination of skills is, is very hard. And then training people in this combination of things is also very hard. So traditional computer science is very deterministic, it's very discreet, but machine learning also requires continuous statistical, et cetera. And a lot of computer scientists don't know how to think that way. So it's actually, and we, you know, at the better universities we are starting to do this, but you know, it's gonna take you know, a certain amount it's going to take a certain amount of time for this to spread. The other thing is, you know, and, and I know that a lot of you know, uh, physicists and mathematicians get jobs in machine learning, is that because the demand so far ex so it exceeds the supply by so much, a lot of people are just starting to do machine learning and data science because, you know, because the demand is there. This is a little bit like what happened in the 80s with PCs, right? Suddenly there weren't enough programmers, so you know, poets and piano players became uh, software engineers, which you know, I love poets and piano players, but that's a lot of why a lot of software is so bad, because the people never learn to do it, right? It's like we go like, oh, but don't they know that this is how you do NBC? No, they never did. Like, you know, somebody was needed, and I think something similar is happening in machine learning today. Do you have an opinion of where the leadership will be in this area five years from now? And let's posit that the current, leader, the current leaders, leaders' companies will continue to do well. Who will, who will be the new leaders? Where will, the, where will the new research, will there be great breakthroughs in India and China and Israel and Europe? Uh, you, I think you can speak authoritatively based on the students that you see and the partners that you have. Yeah, I think there's breakthroughs in research, the leadership in research, and then and there's the leadership in business, right? The two are related, but they are not the same. I think that... Um, we're going to see breakthroughs in research coming from all over the map, right? Not just the top departments anymore. I mean, the beauty of today's world is that, you know, you could be a kid in, in, you know, in, in high school and have a great idea. And in fact, part of why I wrote my book was that I felt that we need people who are not machine learning, professional machine learning researchers to start thinking about machine learning problems because they will have different ideas from the ones that we are already thinking along these tracks have. The reason I want to focus on this, we have a very international audience uh, here, and, and thank, God, thank God for the Milken Conference for bringing you all here. We can talk about this. Um, my standard advice to, to people internationally is fiber solves almost all of your problems, and I'm talking about physical fiber, um, and that you need to rush to wire your countries, governments, buildings, schools, and so forth fiber. 
because with fiber you can begin to process the kind of data that we're talking about. And then the next thing, is it sounds like based on what you're saying, national focus around getting the kind of specialized skills that we're talking to give you a competitive edge. A number of, a number of extremely foresighted countries have set up institutes in these areas and are trying very hard. This is a land, a, a, a race, if you will. And the countries that say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine, It'll, we'll get to it, will not get the extra benefits right, in their businesses, society, and so forth. Let's spend a couple more minutes talking about what, uh, what people always want to talk about with me, um, which is what happens to employment, the human condition, how do people organize themselves relative to this information? Um, you talked about this a little earlier. Um, I used to think that humans and computers would split their duties based on what they were good at. But more and more, computers are getting pretty good at doing some of the tasks that humans are doing. So, uh, for example, photo detection, computers are probably equal to or better at. Self-driving cars, we'll see, but I can assure you that if you have a teenager, you'd rather have the car drive the teenager than the other way around. This is not a complicated question. We can design an artificial teenager. <laughs> Uh, as long as there's a programming button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As, 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 as long as you can power cycle the... That's right. Reboot today. Yeah. <laughs> um, take, us, take us through your view of five years from now, ten from years, what are humans doing, what are the computers doing? I think the frontier is going to keep shifting. I think in the, in the near term, by which I mean you know, less than ten years, what we're going to see is I think some jobs will disappear, and it's, you know, it's important to, to, to think about those. I think, however, it is easier to see the jobs that will disappear than the ones that will appear. Many, many millions of new kinds of jobs will appear. So let's talk about that, because no, everyone always likes to write the negative. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, we're going to lose this job and that job. What are the new jobs that will appear? Yeah, so there, there's a whole bunch of things. So to start with the more banal ones, you know, machine learning makes a lot of things cheaper, as a result of which the demand for them is going to go up. The demand for complementary goods is going to go up. People are going to have more money in their pockets. So, for example, you know, maybe trucks will be self-driving. There'll be many fewer jobs for truckers, but people will pay less for their goods. So will they spend, they still will get a better house, and maybe those truck drivers will become construction workers, which, by the way, construction work is very hard for machine learning you know, systems to do. So there's all this dynamic, right? But then there's also the things that are possible to do that weren't possible without machine learning. And I'll give you an example, right? I think it's actually an important one. A computer is an amazingly powerful thing. It lets you be a minor god. You can, this is the beauty of computer science, is like you can imagine something and then you make it happen. But unfortunately, then in order to make it happen, today you have to be a computer scientist who knows how to program. And you know, it takes a particular kind of person with a particular kind of quirky mind to actually you know, know how to program a computer and debug it and so on and so forth. Once AI has gotten a bit farther along and computers understand natural language, which they're already starting to do, anybody can program a computer. You can go, you, know, you have an idea and you just explain to your computer what you want it to do and, and, and it'll be happening. So instead of having whatever X million programmers in the world, we will have billions. Everybody will be able to be a programmer. And just imagine the amount of progress that will happen compared to today. So in your model, you'll be able to say, please write the following program. Yeah, you, will, you, will, you, will, you won't even it. put it that way. You would say, like, you know, here's an idea that I have, right? What about having an app that you actually, that calls a car for you? <laughs> <laughs> um, to finish up, I think there, that's an answer maybe 10 years from now. I think in the short term, uh, computer scientists are working very hard to make this accessible to mere mortals. You've just uh, described how specialized these skills are and why our industry is obsessed with this. Uh, there's such great demand for talent and hiring people out of universities and so forth. Uh, what I've wanted to have for a long time or is essentially a SQL, if you're following database logic, a SQL command where you have all of the sort of columns of training data and then you have a column which is the outcome, feed it to the system and produce the solution. And if you could do that with billions of entries, right, a tremendous number of business problems could be done by a simple procedure call. Here's the data, here's what I already know, make me a system that will make that happen forever. And then you could constantly iterate. And there's hope that we'll be able to do this very, very soon, uh, both at Google and elsewhere, that making this stuff accessible to normal programmers and therefore the people in your corporations should lead significant significant operating efficiencies if 
just at the base level, ignoring your tantalizing vision of new ideas. Yeah, I mean, I would say that to some degree this is already happening. In some areas, like for example, you gave the example of medical diagnosis. If you give you know, a machine learning program a database of patient records and their diagnosis, in 30 seconds it will learn to diagnose them better than human doctors. But, there are, but of course, in some areas this happens, in other areas it doesn't, and the question is how broadly can we make it? So, so I think from an industry perspective, if we can figure out a way that that can occur in 30 seconds as opposed to one year with lots of lawyers and incompatible data formats, it will materially improve your prospect of getting out of the hospital alive, which is what we all care about. Yeah. Um, thank you all, thank you for coming, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.